Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany Zhang and I'm the founder and host of Undocumented History, an online YouTube video podcast. In today's episode, episode 4, I will be speaking with Donald Hayashi about his role as the Dayton president of the Japanese American Citizens League. The Japanese American Citizens League is the quote... The nation's oldest and largest Asian American slash Pacific Islander civil rights organization. JACL's mission is to quote again, protect the civil rights of Japanese Americans and all others who are victimized by injustice and bigotry. In this interview, I will be discussing with Donald Hayashi about his leadership role at the JACL, compare ethnic awareness in the 70s versus today, and how not to repeat history in the age of social media and limited attention spans. Here is my conversation with him. Welcome to Undocumented History, an online video podcast focused on educating others about the importance of East Asian culture and history, while also amplifying Asian voices and stories. I'm Tiffany Zhang, your host, and today we have a very special guest, Donald Hayashi. Mr. Hayashi is the president of the Dayton chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, and he was born in Portland, Oregon. Mr. Hayashi, thank you so much for being here today and taking the time to join me. Before we start, is there anything else that you want to add regarding to what you do and who you are? Well, I, you know, I've been a part of the Asian American community all my life. Uh, I joined um, a youth organization called Junior JACL when I was uh, just out of high school mm -hmm. and uh, have stayed with the organization all these years. I did a student internship with JACL's mm -hmm. national organization uh, while I was in college. And then um, in the early 1970s, I uh, became a regional director. I covered the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Utah. Mm. And uh, after that, I uh, went to work at our national headquarters office in San Francisco mm. and did that for a few years. And uh, then, you know, uh, eventually I moved to Ohio from the West Coast. And uh, I worked for the United Methodist Church for several years, and that's what brought me to Ohio. So, oh, that's yeah. So, yeah, that's so that really just gives you a little bit more about me. <laughs> yeah, that's so great to hear. So basically, I'm just going to jump in right with a few questions, and then we'll kind of see how it goes from there. So my first question is, um, I guess, like, can you talk a little bit about your family background and how your racial identity, like, shaped your experiences growing up? Yeah, I am the youngest child of uh, a, a family uh, that were my parents and th and three boys, mm -hmm. and I'm the youngest. And uh, you know, my dad was a Methodist minister who served um, primarily Japanese American churches, mm -hmm. and so my church life was pretty much in the ethnic community setting. But of course, I attended a public school, and uh, my public school was very uh, multiracial. Mm -hmm. In fact, my high school principal used to talk about Jonah. this being the United, little United Nations. Hold on just a moment. Oh, no, you're good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I grew up with uh, virtually a, a very mixed racial background. And in college, I majored in sociology, hoping to be a community social worker. Mm -hmm. And graduating from um, college, I worked in uh, the Lower East Side of Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. which was poor white families, mm -hmm. and uh, had the opportunity to work with them. Um, because of my religious background, I have always been a member of the Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. and knew that we were valued for who we are. And yet I realized that in most community settings, I'm seen as, well, I'm not white, I'm not black, I'm other. And uh, the most frequent question I'm asked is, how long have you lived in our country? Mm -hmm. And when I tell them that I was born in the United States, they, the next response is usually, my, but you speak English good. Now, that's not proper English, but uh, <laughs> that's how they respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so, you know, over the years, I have worked with uh, a lot of different uh, racial ethnic minorities, and I have enjoyed that. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, feel that that's really important because in the United States, 
we still see people on the basis of race and it's important that we bring understanding mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. my upbringing uh you know living in a community setting talking about my family history has been important the mm -hmm. history not just of my uh, immediate family but as uh the asian american community mm -hmm. so yes that's so great to hear um i guess like my next question would be how how did you get involved with like the JACL? Well, when I was uh, just out of high school, um, so they were trying to organize a youth group in JACL because in a few years they were going to be hosting a national convention for the Japanese American Citizens League. And at that time, the organization would have included both young people and adults. And they had no youth organization, so they thought they ought to organize a youth chapter. So I became a junior JACLer mm -hmm. and served on the board. I edited a newsletter for them. And a few years later, I moved uh, to a different community. My family moved. and mm -hmm. uh, But I still stayed in junior JCL. And I was asked when I was in college, would I be interested in doing a summer internship uh, in Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. And um, I was able to accept it because I had a brother who was living in LA. I could stay in his apartment and, uh, and do this. And so I worked for JACL that summer. Um, and then um, a short time later, I became the chapter president of the Portland Junior JACL. And we were closely with the adult JACL. And um, when I graduated college, they said, you know, you need to serve on the senior JACL board. So mm -hmm. I became their treasurer and eventually became their chapter president. <laughs> mm -hmm. And about that time, uh, the national organization said, you know, we really need to set up some regional offices. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was brought on to be a regional director, which covered the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Utah. There were about uh, 20 chapters between those in those four states. Mm -hmm. And I traveled a lot, meeting with people in the community, both the Japanese American community as well as the broader community, mm -hmm. to help to explain to them why it was important to have a JCL organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, I I got married and uh, my wife and I both decided it was probably not wise for me to be traveling mm -hmm. about 20 days a month. And oh. so I was going to resign that position. And I was told um, if I would be willing to do administrative work, I could work at the national office in San Francisco. And so we moved to San Francisco and I worked for JCL another four years. And then um, because nonprofits don't pay a particularly large salary, mm -hmm. I said, you know, maybe I need to do something that earns a little more money so that um, we might start a family and maybe mm -hmm. buy a house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so I became a consultant and worked uh, on a project, public works project in San Francisco. But I always kept up my JACL membership. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would work with them on projects that they had mm -hmm. because um, standing up for human rights, mm -hmm. helping people get the kind of care that they need was very important. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always enjoyed working with people. So mm -hmm. uh, that is why I, I've stayed involved with JCL. When I moved to Dayton, Ohio, uh, little did I know, but a friend who I had talked with on the west coast to find out where i should look for an apartment had a friend in dayton and called and so soon after i arrived for for work there was a phone message from uh leah nakauchi and i didn't know who this person was mm -hmm. but eventually got in touch with her and she said to me i was told that you were looking for an apartment my friends uh, have asked me, and so my sister and I have been looking for an apartment for you. Would oh. you be willing to come this afternoon and see these places? And I got permission and went out to look. And, you know, we uh, what they said before, um, we had dinner together, and then they said to me, uh, whatever you do, get an unfurnished apartment because we have young people 
uh, we have children who had furniture when they went to college and mm -hmm. it's in our basement and we'll furnish your apartment for you. And shortly thereafter, uh, one of the husbands called me and said, you know, we need a speaker for our JCL dinner. Would you be willing to be the speaker? And I said, I would love to attend, but why do you want me to speak? Well, you work for the national organization. Do you know all about it? You can talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I was a little reluctant because it had been almost 20 years since I worked for JACL. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I said, sure, I will come to the dinner. And they insisted that I be the speaker. And, uh, uh -huh. you know, but there was that friendship that developed, the caring nature. And uh, that has, you know, been very helpful to me over the years. And um, if I can be that hospitable to someone else, I'd want mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think it was really cool to hear your story from like, like the progression of your story, like first you worked um, in the junior program and then you like slowly went up to the senior program and then like you went to San Francisco and then yeah. you like became the Dayton president and then you also became like a speaker at the dinner. Like I thought that progression was really cool and I really like this um, statement that you said about like you, how you want to like stand up for like human rights. You know, yeah. I feel like that part really resonated with me. So I guess my next question would be like, what are some of like the events and things that JCL does to like fulfill its mission, I guess? Well, one of the things that I did when I was in Oregon, as well as the Bay Area and now in Ohio, is if there is a school that wishes to have a program about uh, Japanese American or Asian American history, mm -hmm. I have been willing to go and be a speaker. And so I've spoken at several colleges, several high schools, some community organizations uh, mm -hmm. like the local uh, Dayton Art Institute mm -hmm. wanted to provide training for their volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the hospitals here in Dayton wanted their staff to become more familiar with Asian Americans. So um, I have had, I've spoken in those kind of situations. In addition to that, um, in the Dayton community, we have what's known as an international festival. Mm -hmm. It involves over 30 countries uh, mm -hmm. from all around the globe. And uh, we have food, uh, we have entertainment, mm -hmm. uh, we are required to have a cultural booth that kind of mm -hmm. shares the culture of our people. And um, each year uh, we do it for a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We bring between 20 and 30,000 people from the greater Dayton community to come participate in this. And, you know, uh, it's, it's very popular because you can go and try interesting foods um you can have beverage uh in uh for for those that are of age they can uh consume beer or wine and um and then we have cultural performances by various groups in the greater dayton area we have a taiko drum uh group that performs each year we have a a women's japanese chorus that's that provides uh songs um, and uh, we've had uh, some judo uh, demonstrations. Mm -hmm. So we try to in invoke that in, you know, in the Dayton area, the Asian American population is only about 3% of the total population. Mm -hmm. And yet by participating in this, we expose ourselves to a much wider community. Mm -hmm. And it's important because in Dayton, most people, when they think of racial minorities, think of the white and black. They don't think of, of other ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And so we've really pushed that. Right now, we're working on a legislative package to try to modify the school curriculum so that it would include mm -hmm. the migration patterns of mm -hmm. racial ethnic people, of Native Americans who, for the most part, were pushed out of Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and you know, the Jewish community, other ethnic groups and religious groups that have migration patterns that would be interesting because, you know, young people aren't going to just stay in the same place. They may venture out to other places. And it's important that they have exposure to the life experiences of various people. And it's nice to be able to taste 
food and culture and other things. So we think that that would be a way which we might equip our young people here in Ohio mm -hmm. with a broader background so that when they go out into the world, whether it's here in the state of Ohio or in other parts of the U.S. or even across the globe, they will have had that experience of experiencing other um, other cultures. And so we're working on that right now. Um, the legislature does not seem very open to having a special attention to Asian Americans because the assumption is all Asians are successful. They don't need this kind of exposure. But the truth of the matter is our young people, um, I think, are disadvantaged in that they don't learn about their own culture, but also uh, non-Asians don't learn about the history of Asians in the United States and in the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that that's one reason why I enjoy going out and talking with folks. Some members of our organization will um, do things like uh, Ikebana, which mm -hmm. is a Japanese flower arrangement. Uh, mm -hmm. They may do... Um, you know, uh, paper folding, uh, which, uh, you know, is, is very, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, very popular. So, you know, various cultural things we want to expose people to as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. And, and, and so as JCL, we work with not only other Asian American groups, but other minorities. Uh, my last paid employment was working largely in an African-American low-income community. Mm -hmm. And many of those people thought it was very interesting that I would be interested in working with them. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, um, we, we try to cross uh, the, the racial uh, boundaries and, and uh, you know, try to get mm -hmm. folks uh, to see each other, not just by their cultural traditions but see them as human beings mm -hmm. because we can all be accepted for who we are and we have more in common than we have separate mm -hmm. yeah definitely I think <laughs> the event that you were describing reminds me of my school's culture fest because we there's like performances of like all different cultures and also there's like booths and stuff and there's like a competition so like we hire judges and they like go around and rate each booth and then they like because it, it like motivates people to like do like have better booths if you know what I mean yes. and that what you were describing just like kind of reminds me of that and I guess like something else that really struck out to me was like the part you said about the legislative like pushing and more like Asian American representation education yes. because for me I took world history AP this year like an AP class so mm. it's just like nationwide so like everyone like learns like the same standard curriculum but yes. in that like standard curriculum there was only like two instances of two instances of Asian American culture, which was like the Chinese Exclusion Act and also like the Japanese like concentration camps during World War II. Yes. And I thought that was kind of like upsetting in a way because like there's so much more to Asian American history than just those two instances of like discrimination that happened. That's so right. yeah, good luck on your project though. I hope- Yeah, and, and it's important that we see not only the positive things and also the negative things, but we learn from those negative things how we can be better. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the incarceration that my family experienced, I did not because I wasn't born yet, mm -hmm. but uh, my parents and my brothers um, were incarcerated and, you know, lived under very harsh circumstances. Um, but, you know, what I see the value of that more is how people were able to sustain themselves and overcome that adversity with positive things. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I think that forbearance that they had in order to overcome what they had was probably more important than, uh, uh, it, it was a terrible act, but it's how people cope with it, how they deal with it. Uh, and then, you know, how they, began to overcome some of the problems. My mother wanted to be a school teacher. Um, she could not teach school when she graduated because uh, Asian Americans were not accepted mm -hmm. as appropriate to be school teachers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, 
th those are some of the things uh, many, many folks were told, you know, you have to work in your own community. You can't work beyond. Mm -hmm. So people with college degrees were working in the produce department of grocery stores that their family owned, as opposed to going out and really working and achieving. And it was only later on that they began to, to do that. And as a, as a consequence, became very successful because they worked at it. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, you know, um, uh, my, my, um, I have two uncles who were farmers and, you know, farming isn't a particularly, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. highly really, but they were very, very scientific in the way they did. And so they were very successful. Mm -hmm. And as they were successful, they also became more competitive. Yeah. And competition tends to sometimes bring the worst thing out of people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in the early 1900s, they, in addition to excluding Chinese from the United States, they passed alien land laws so that persons of Asian ancestry, because they were not white, could not buy land in several states in the Western U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, many of the the people in JUCL think, well, that's all in the past. But right now in the state of Texas and the state of Florida, there is legislation proposed to bar foreigners from owning property in your states. It's mm -hmm. the same kind of alien land law that was imposed against Asians 100 years ago. So it's come back to, uh, uh, to be a, a, a real burden on people. So you know, those are things that we have to cope with. And that's why history is so important, that we learn from our mistakes. We try to do better, mm. not to repeat them. Yeah, that reminds me of a famous quote, like those who forget history. Oh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it before, but it's like those who forget history are condemned to repeat it. So I guess like in the age of like social media and limited attention spans, like what is your advice on how to best like teach the younger generation about Japanese American and Asian American history? Like, would it be through like education or? Well, part of it is I think we have to have fun with it. You know, if we can do it by playing games or riddles or these kinds of things, that's all important. Um, that we just kind of learn from each other that we really, um, yes, we have certain traditions that are different, but much of what we do is very similar. Now, mm -hmm. I just came back from a trip visiting my, my cousins in California, and they have decided that um, they can keep their house cleaner if they take their shoes off when they enter. Mm -hmm. Now, I never did that growing up. We always just you know, wore our shoes indoors when we did outdoors. But when you think about it, in many Asian cultures, you did take your shoes off when you came in to keep mm -hmm. the house cleaner. And that maybe is something that we can learn from each other, that that we can find that maybe it is better <laughs> to do things a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, but I think part of it is not seeing this as a burden, but seeing this as an opportunity mm -hmm. to learn new things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think it's very important that we uh, share the contributions, the history, because there are a lot of inventions. There are a lot of things scientifically as well as culturally that have been passed on that have become um, helpful in American society. And we need to learn from that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you enjoy eating out, but you know it's nice that we have a variety of foods that we can eat. We don't all have to eat the same thing meal after meal. We can, we can have variety. And and that's part of what how we can grow as a as a society. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. Just like learning from each other, but also making sure we have like empathy for empathy and compassion for each other. Because yes. especially like with social media, I feel like there's a lack of empathy in some way because people they just see the other person as like another like online person like it isn't like face to face like if you know what I mean yeah. so also, also sharing things but also having like empathy and compassion for each other which I think would also help right. teach the younger generations yeah and and you know doing things together whether it's it's sports or recreation or maybe cultural things maybe uh, going to art exhibits or 
or to a theater performance mm -hmm. together and then talking about what is it that that impressed you about that we can learn from each other and we have much more that we we could be better by doing that rather than just being you know mm -hmm. <laughs> quiet mm -hmm. and only to our own group yeah mm -hmm. And I guess like another question following off of that, like in a recent article, you were quoted as saying in the in the early 70s, ethnic awareness became a dominant thing. How would you compare and contrast like the 70s with today? Oh, well, the 70s seemed like a long time ago, but, yeah. you know, with um, the uh, the influence of black power and. Mm -hmm. Uh, appreciation for, you know, Black is beautiful and these things, Asian Americans began saying, well, we could be proud of who we are, too. Mm -hmm. And we have something that we can share that isn't there otherwise. And so that's why Asian American studies programs were organized on a variety of college campuses, as was Hispanic history, African history, you know, these other uh, and I think all of those make us better and stronger. Um, and, you know, not all the students are of that ethnicity. We can do things cross-racially as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, being an Asian American, I had to learn how to adapt to other cultures very quickly because there are very few of us <laughs> in relationship to the other groups. Um so we've always learned how you work cross-culturally, mm -hmm. but particularly for the majority society, they consider this kind of odd or different. Well, it can also be unique and special. Mm -hmm. So we need to see these things in a positive light, uh, not just, you know, the way it always has been. Mm -hmm. um, how is today different from the 1970s? Well, for one, with the internet, with with all the different uh, tech technologies, we have much more ability to do it. I mean, you can study with people all around the globe now mm -hmm. um, in your everyday life. Uh, that wasn't possible back then. Um, at the same time, I do still think direct contact and human relationships are stronger with not just... Um, over online but to do it in person mm. and uh, we can learn from each other that way and mm. i think sometimes uh it's very convenient to just do things everything online mm -hmm. well everything online doesn't necessarily um uh, give us the the breadth of understanding mm. of other mm. groups and individuals and you know obviously we're going to have some differences and we may not always agree on things, but we can learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that that's the difference. Um, I think today, too, there are many more multiracial young people than there were when I was your age. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people that were biracial back then were really uh, a, a, a very small proportion of the population. Today, it's a much larger portion. Mm -hmm. uh, there is much more interracial marriage. There is more uh, crossbreeding. There is adoption of of people from around the globe. So there's, I think, more opportunity for that, and and that can all be positive, if if we choose for mm -hmm. it to be that way. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Uh, so you know, I think that. Um, yeah, Today, we have opportunities that probably weren't there back then. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other thing is through the, our national organization, we have a program called Kakahashi, mm -hmm. where we take um, young people in their early 20s to Japan, and they live there for several weeks. Mm -hmm. So they are, are certainly imbued with uh, direct cultural contact. Um, the Japanese government helps provide um the context to make that happen but those young people come back with a much broader understanding of uh japanese culture and japanese culture today as opposed to a hundred years ago when my grandparents came here <laughs> so you know that's that's important to have that kind of experience and i think today there are many many more opportunities for that mm -hmm. whether it's studying abroad or 
uh, touring or visiting, those things have become much more common today than mm -hmm. they were back then. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I think that has a, a, a definite benefit mm -hmm. and some possibilities. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely not just like, like cross cultural, like cross sharing, I guess what you were talking about, but also just like, I feel like society has progressed a lot and people are a lot more like open and like understanding because like even though I did even though like in our world history AP curriculum there are only like two instances of like Asian American discrimination I know that like back then like it wasn't even present and like someone else I was talking to said that there's only one sentence in his entire textbook that talked yeah. about like Asian American history so even though there is like room for improvement I feel like times are definitely changing and yeah. hopefully in the future we will finally like reach a place mm -hmm. where I mean for when I was in high school there was no mention of Japanese American incarceration during oh. World War II it wasn't even in the textbooks mm -hmm. and I remember when I was in high school um on television they had uh, every Sunday night they kind of uh, had a program about something about history Mm -hmm. And there was one about Japanese American internment is what they mm -hmm. called it then. And um, for my fellow Japanese American young people, many of them, this was the first time that they ever knew that Japanese Americans had been arrested and taken away oh. because all they were told by their parents, because frankly, the parents were still ashamed that they were incarcerated during the war. So they would say to their kids, well, when we were your age, we went to camp. That was it. Mm -hmm. And camp for these young people meant like scout camp, church yeah. camp, you know, yeah. kind of a fun thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, as horrendous as, as the incarceration was. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when this program came on that talked about this, several of my classmates who were Japanese American said, this is the first time we ever heard about that oh. and it really wasn't until the 1980s when there was a congressional committee put together to examine the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II that many of those who were incarcerated were even willing to talk about it they were still terribly embarrassed and ashamed that this had happened mm -hmm. and not that it was their fault but they mm -hmm. still kind of felt that, well, maybe there is something that I did that caused this. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not saying that we should talk about yeah. um, today. I think um, young people are more um, ha have become uh, more familiar mm -hmm. with the fact that there was an incarceration. Um, but. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was yeah. in high school, mm -hmm. several of my classmates were just startled. Mm -hmm. And I had heard about it because we had visitors in our home for for dinner meals regularly. And they would ask questions about this. So my parents would tell these stories over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So I at least knew about some mm -hmm. of that. When I was in college, I did a little more exploration in that. And, um, you know, a few person said well I have a few uh, newspaper articles that I'd be willing to share with you and so forth and that's what got me starting to teach about the Japanese American experience during World War II and there were two high schools in Portland that asked me every year to come and do a presentation mm -hmm. so I would go do about a two-day pre presentation during the U.S. history class mm -hmm. um wow. But, you know, still a lot of people don't know about that. And mm -hmm. as you moved away from the West Coast, you even had less and less of that kind of, um, you know, experience. Mm -hmm. Now, with Chinese Americans, you know, the Exclusion Act, but the Chinese were brought here to help build the railroads in addition to working in the gold mines. And um, at the celebration when the train joined yeah. in Utah, if you look at that photograph, there is not a single Chinese American in the picture. Mm -hmm. There are only Caucasian who are basically, the Irish build it from Omaha to Utah. It was the Chinese that build it from California to Utah. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but they were not included in the celebration of the completion of this because mm -hmm. they were seen as as yeah, not yeah. not to be seen in that mm -hmm. kind of setting now mm -hmm. that that's a terrible um omission and you know we need to give credit that the chinese did build mm -hmm. that western segment through very mountainous and, and difficult circumstances mm -hmm. uh they helped to bring farming to california at a mm -hmm. high level that today a good percentage of the produce that is consumed by americans all across the united states comes out of the west with technology largely that was brought over from asia to mm -hmm. the united states it wasn't mm -hmm. something that just happened overnight um mm -hmm. it, it 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 has those things Mm -hmm. several things in medicine that our Asians were pioneers in mm -hmm. um you know um so you know we need to um acknowledge the contributions the history the the the, the talents that Asian Americans have brought and that's mm -hmm. important that that be shared in everyday life mm -hmm. yeah definitely so that was like my last question. And I feel like we had a very interesting conversation today. Um, thank you so much for coming and speaking with me. Thank you to so much, or thank you so much to everyone at home watching. Um, yeah, I will see you guys next time. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Tiffany.